Hi, this is Steve Cropper. You're listening to Premier Guitars Big Five. My favorite guitar is usually the one I'm playing. The one I'm playing now, I've been playing for 10 years. The one I retired, I played for 14. <laughs> so something's working. I have a trick when I go on stage. I look down at the guitar, I say, man, if you don't perform tonight, you're going to be firewood in the morning. <laughs> Somehow it seems to work. The Telecaster was made by Leo Fender originally. And that's all well and good. So everything I've been playing is a copy of a Telecaster. But it's to my specs and it works great. So it is what it is. A lot of the big companies, they wanted to pay me a lot of money to signature, sign one of their guitars. I said, you want my signature, you're going to shell out over it and sell a guitar for three or $4,000. I want a guitar that will sell for under $1,000. When a kid goes to his dad and when he asks, son, what do you want for Christmas? He said, dad, I want a guitar. I don't want him to have to go out and pay $5,000 for a guitar. Buy something that works, not a piece of crap, just something that really works that's under $1,000. If he buys the strap, the case, and all that with it, it's probably going to be over that. So I think we made the guitar, Hartley Peavy made the, the, the guitar we had out there, the Cropper Classic. And we sold it for, I think, under, under 800 or about seven something. Kept it in the closet for, I don't know, four or five years before I pulled it out. And I wanted to retire that other one. And I still have it too. And this one I was going to retire and raise some money for, for kids' cancer. And I ran over it one time. I said, now i got a real excuse to retire. Well, I ran in the house and got a backup guitar, come down to the studio to overdub, and I plugged it up. And my engineer said, it sounds just like it always does. So I kept it, and we still got it. There's no stress marks in there, nothing. All I did was crush the electronics, like the volume and tone control and that kind of thing. I was late running for a session on a Monday morning, and I grabbed the guitar, and I had a painting with me that I wanted to bring to the office. Not this office, but the other place we were at. And uh, I opened the trunk of my car up, and it was full of golf clubs. I went, oh, man. So I set the painting down on one side, my guitar on the other, and when I got the golf clubs in the garage, I loaded it up with the painting, and I just took off, and I went, oh, I just ran over something. <laughs> As the car went back, I looked down the front of it. There was my guitar. I went, oh, my God. It took me at least 10 minutes to open that case because I knew I was going to find nothing but pick up, but toothpicks in there. <laughs> so what I did, I did crush it. So I took the back off of it and slowly hammered everything back up to the top, and everything was fine. Didn't bother the neck of the guitar or the pickups or nothing. Just got the... The, the electronics of the tone control and the uh, volume control. And that's all I did. And I just hammered it back to the top. And I played it that day on a session. It was fine. And the guys on that uh, I played with with the Blues Brothers, they said, keep that guitar. They're the ones that taught me to get it in the first place. If I was going somewhere to live on a desert island by myself, what album would I take with me? There's so many great albums out there. Beatles albums and all kinds of albums that are great. I love uh, David Bowie's album. The Ziggy Stardust one. That's a great album. You have to be Atlantic Crossing by Rod Stewart. I gave a lot of thought to that. So <laughs> I wrote uh, four or five songs with him and uh, worked with Tommy Dowd. Tom Dowd got production credits. I'm not looking for production credits, but I worked with Tom on that particular album. And Rod and I became friends after that album. And I, that's a long time ago, and we've been friends ever since. So that's pretty cool. When I hear a guitar player or a musician bragging on himself, telling the world how great he is, why don't you let the world tell you how great you are? That bothers me when guys do that. I don't mind anybody having an ego. A lot of people do. I pretend that I don't have one. I like to think that I don't have one. And uh, I'm not any good. I do more by putting myself down than I do building myself up. I let somebody else do that. Let me just play for you. If you don't like it, I'll quit playing <laughs> If you like it, I'll keep playing. <laughs> so I will tell this story. I listened to Chet Atkins and Les Paul and B.B. King like everybody else did. And I realized very early, when I was about 14 to 15 years old, I said, the world doesn't need another one of them. They've already got one. Why well, copy that person? It, the world does not need two. So I let a guy who didn't get to make it, I thought he was going to make it, Loman Pauling with the Five Royals. He wrote those songs. He played guitar on them. He was the leader of the band. And that's the guy I modeled myself after. A lot of licks I played simulated. <laughs>
play exactly like his, but I did an album one time and I had a, a co-producer that called me one time. He said, you've already told me you weren't interested in doing another instrumental album. He said, why don't you do an album and dedicate it to that guy that you're always saying influenced you? And I said, hey, that's a good idea. Well, I think if there is such a thing as a secret weapon, I do something that I don't think anybody else does. It doesn't appear that they do. I'm always listening to the other guy, especially the singer. If there's no singer, it doesn't matter. I'm always listening to everybody that's on a session. And I try to play stuff that enhances what they're doing rather than try to play something that's better than what they're doing. I don't do that. I don't think that way. I try to play something that might enhance them. If a singer's singing, I will complete the line. You know, and I try my darndest to not step on anybody. It's sort of like a movie. You don't want to step on somebody else's line. Let them say their line, then you say your line. Don't don't start your line before they get through. But I hate it when I have to tell somebody, this is not a guitar album. This is not a horn album. This is not, you know, this is about the singer we're playing behind. Tom Dowd taught me an old trick a long time ago. When guys were reading music, he would put the lyrics on the stand with them so they would know what they were playing about. That's a good way to interpret music. Is play something that sounds like what they're talking about, what they're singing about. It's, it's easy enough to do if you think that way. If you don't think that way, if you just want to play people, you, your impression, impersonation of music lessons you've been taught. Well, good. Play all those notes in one bar and impress the heck out of everybody, especially your mother and your grandmother. They're going to say, Dad, my son was so good. So somebody asked me one time, what would you think, Cropper? I said, well, too bad his mom wasn't here. <laughs> Not being facetious or anything, it's just too bad because she would have liked it. She would have loved it. She would have told him how great he was. I don't know. I don't want to tell him that I didn't wasn't impressed. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> That's the hardest thing in the world to do, is to be an A&R director and say something negative about somebody. I can't do that. I try. One more, let's do another one then. <laughs> you don't say that last one was not all that good. You don't tell anybody that. You want to encourage them. <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,